welcome back to City Line. With me, I have a very familiar face, somebody who is very beloved in Tacoma for what she does and also for who she is and for how strong she is. I'm talking about Amy Allison. She is the Director of Community Mobilization for Associated Ministries, and she's here to talk about VITA. And uh, Amy, welcome back to City Line, my dear. It's so good to see you. Thank you. So Amy, good to be back. It's great to have you back. Amy, for people who don't <laughs> know what VITA is uh, and what it stands for, what do we say to them? Okay, so VITA stands for Volunteer Income Tax Assistance. It's a nationwide program sponsored by the IRS um, and but offered, actually implemented by community organizations locally that provides free tax preparation service to low and moderate income taxpayers. And we do this because it is volunteer run. And um, so because the volunteers are offering the service and that's how we're off, able to offer it free of charge. That is incredible. So you you mentioned the IRS is, 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 is a part of this. Who else is involved in VITA? <laughs> Well, this year in Pierce County, the two main partners are Associated Ministries and Goodwill of the Olympics and Rainier Region. And then there's also a similar service, um, except that the focus is more on seniors as opposed to just the low moderate income taxpayers that's offered locally by AARP Tax Aid. And then we have other community partners who help us in different ways through funding, marketing, or actually hosting our tax sites, such as United Way of Pierce County and Tacoma Housing Authority. It's fabulous. So in the past, when I have had you on the comfy couch pre-COVID, mm -hmm. uh, and we talked about VITA and where it would be held and uh, what it would look like when people walked into that event, we we are not having that conversation right now, Amy. <laughs> so how will it look differently this year due to COVID? Okay. Well, first of all, most of the services are going to take place remotely. So if you have access to the internet through a computer, a laptop, a tablet, or a smartphone, you can receive no contact service. Um, you'll complete an intake online and um, you'll be given instructions for how to unload your, upload, sorry, not unload, upload your tax documents to a, through a secure channel electronically. And um, then a volunteer tax preparer will work on from their own home um, on your tax return, and then they'll contact you when it's finished, usually within three to seven days. And if there's any questions along the line that they have while they're actually doing your return, they'll reach out to you to ask. So this is this is impressive because part of this time with COVID has been obviously sheltering in place, but also removing barriers for people who can uh, who who need to access the services. Mm -hmm. That are coming out of the pandemic. So, if somebody wants to do their taxes themselves, um, uh, but they need a, maybe a little help or a little checks and balances, what do we do with somebody like that? Okay. Well, I mean, both the online service that if if you want a tax preparer to do it for you, and the do-it-yourself option. Um, there's one. Um, one URL. <laughs> I don't know what's showing right now on the screen, but it's getyourrefund.org.org slash piercewa. So um, that is the URL that's going to allow people this year to both access um, our online services where a tax preparer will prepare your taxes remotely for you or to do it yourself. Uh, so, he, so here's the tricky part of this. What about people who don't have access to an internet? What should they do? Okay. So there are going to be six in-person sites available in Pierce County where they can get help. Um, three of these are going to be VITA sites, and three are sites run by AARP Tax Aid. But both locations can serve either population, either the low to moderate income taxpayers or the seniors. So although we individually run them, they can go to either one. Um, all of these in-person sites will be by appointment only. You'll come in only to complete an intake and to drop off your documents for scanning or copying and then you'll leave. And um, most of the tax preparation is still gonna be happening remotely. The tax preparers are gonna then access your documents and then do it remotely. And then you'll be called um, to come back in to pick up the finished return when it's done. Um, in most cases, well, in a few cases, it'll be the same day. In most cases, it'll probably be about a week later that you'll come back for the finished return. Outstanding. So, Amy, can you tell us who qualifies for this service, mm -hmm. number one? 
Uh, and then number two, what documents do they need to bring with them? Okay. Um, so the, the folks who qualify, um, we're really looking at the low to moderate income taxpayers, which um, we're defining as folks with incomes of 57,000 and under. Those are folks that are potentially eligible for the earned income credit. Um, and then again, the AARP tax aid sites focus on seniors. Um, but again, both our sites will serve either population. And um, what you need to bring, I always tell people, and this is true whether you're uploading your documents electronically or whether you're coming in person, most important, make sure you have a social security card or an official document from social security for everyone on the return. That's really important in a time of identity theft. We have to make sure that we can identify you as you and the folks that you're claiming. Uh, photo ID for primary taxpayer and their spouse, and then all of their income documents and expense documents. So, Outstanding. So um, when we talk about AARP and their definition of a senior, would you give us an age cutoff on that also, Amy? Usually they say 60 plus. Okay. Their focus is folks 60 plus. All right. So I want to go back to that in-person drop off. How are you going to keep everyone safe during this in-person drop-off and then pick up? Okay, so we are going to be following all state-required COVID guidelines. Um, everyone needs to wear a mask when you come in for your appointment, and we're going to have hand sanitizer, plexiglass shields that are be between the, uh, the volunteers and the taxpayers, and other protective measures in place. And of course, the, um, the appointments are going to be very short because you're not gonna be sitting there for the whole time getting your taxes done. You're only there to do the intake and the drop off your documents. Um, and because it's by appointment only. So we're not gonna have the long lines and the, lo the crowded rating rooms that we've had in the past. So that's gonna be a definite um, advantage. So, um, but you do need to call to make an appointment. Again, I'm not quite sure what Fred is able to show on the screen, but each of the six um, in-person sites has its own um, phone number for appointments. And so hopefully he's able to show that on the screen so you can um, know where to actually reach out. Well, Fred's pretty amazing. So I would imagine um, he <laughs> okay. can make that happen. Are there any other changes that we need to know about for this year? We, well, yes, um, everyone all over the country is trying to figure out how to, how to offer tax services safely. And so because of that, um, the IRS has delayed the start of tax season until February 12th. So that's about a three week delay from when they usually um, start. Um, some of our locations and services will be open before then, but just know that this means the IRS can't actually accept the tax returns until um, February 12th. Um, now the, Processing of returns is going to take the same amount of time, which usually if you're getting direct deposit, um, you get it within the three weeks or less, sometimes as fast as a week. Um, but um, the clock starts ticking for that three week period of time on February 12th. So even if you get your taxes done sooner, they're not actually, we're not actually going to be able to send them in until that date. And so Amy, based on that, have they, have they also changed the cutoff date? Uh, right now, it's still April 15th. I don't know if they'll extend it any longer, but right now, it's still the normal cutoff date. All right. So, um, Amy, any happier changes that you want to <laughs> respond to us? Yes, there's, there's two really big ones. One is this year, um, you are allowed to deduct up to $300 in charitable deductions, even if you don't itemize. And that's great because in the past, people who get the standard deduction couldn't deduct anything for their charitable giving. And now they can. So anybody coming to our VITA sites, please bring your charitable deduction receipts because you'll be able to actually deduct them. I love that. And what's the other one? Um, so if you didn't get a stimulus check and you should have, or maybe you had a change in 2020 that qualifies you for some extra stimulus. So for instance, you had a baby in 2020, um, you can actually get claim that stimulus as part of your refund on your when you do your taxes. So you'll get, in, in addition to your regular refund, you'll get extra stimulus if you didn't get it and you now qualify for it. Um, and by the way, just so people know, no one will be penalized in any way for any stimulus that they received. So it's not going to put you in a higher tax bracket or anything like that. But um, so only it can only benefit folks. So folks who didn't actually get the stimulus at all, but they should have, or they should have gotten more because now they have an extra kid or something like that they'll be able to do that on their tax return. Outstanding. Amy, uh, oftentimes I, I call it the COVID fog where uh, our memories sometimes don't serve us as well. Um, if somebody cannot access their documents or let's say 
they cannot find a social security card or it's been lost. I'm sure you get this question a lot as people are suddenly going, I'm getting my documents together and I can't find something. What do what should they do? Um so you do again that is unfortunately we do have to be really strict about that because of identity theft about that requirement of making sure you have an official document from social security. I'm actually in this situation right now. Um cuz Amanda knows my house burned down just before Thanksgiving and lost everything, including all of our documents. Um, so I'm in, I've been in the process of applying for some of those new documents. Um, applying for my own was fairly easy, my own social security card. Um, I, I have uh, with a my social security um, account online. Um, so usually most adults are able to set up a my um, social security account online and actually access it that way they'll ask identifying questions to make sure you're you you know things like you know where did you used to live and some of those things um i'm still in the process of trying to recover one for my daughter that one's a little bit harder um i know right now the social security office is closed but i was able to talk to somebody by phone with social security and they were able to give me some guidance about what i could do so i have some documents that i'm waiting for uh, they told me actually they could accept um, some documents from her health provider, healthcare provider, identifying her age and name and everything like that as identifying documents. So there are ways around it. And um, the local social security office, um, I didn't have a very long wait. The waits are like 15 minutes or less. I know if you try to call the national office, you're going to wait for hours. So I would say call the Tacoma office if you need um, social, you know, help getting a social security card because it wasn't a very long wait. I love that. You know, Amy, with, with people in transition right now and also uh, the lack of housing, those documents, they slip through our fingers. We thought they were in storage. Now they're not. So um, it's, it's wonderful that you have used what's happened to you personally to help others out there, which you are known for. Uh, in terms of misplacing documents. May I share another one too? Because Associated Ministries where I work, our Community Resource Center, one of the services that they provide is helping people to get birth certificates. And they were able to help me get, recover birth certificates for myself and my daughter. So give a little shout out to um, Associated Ministries. Um, that is a resource that we can help provide people. I love that. Well, we have been showing the website across your beautiful face. Amy, thank you so much for taking time uh, to be here today and to talk about taxes. We all cringe, but it's not so cringe worthy when we offer such great services. So thank you so much for all that you do for our community. And uh, Paint Tacoma is coming up here pretty soon. I know. Weather permitting, virus permitting. So I will look forward to having you back in my kitchen here uh, in the springtime, all right? Sounds good, thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. We have much more to come on City Line, so don't go away, we'll be right back. There's an iconic new artwork at Fireman's Park in downtown Tacoma named Swell. It's made of steel and concrete, and it's anchored in a sense of community and global connections. The project was made possible by a unique partnership between the Port of Tacoma and the City of Tacoma. The original idea for the project started when the Port of Tacoma celebrated its centennial in 2018. Claire Petrich, a port commissioner at that time, helped lead that centennial celebration program throughout Pierce County. 100 years was really special. And we wanted to have something that would be remembered within Tacoma Pierce County for the next 100 years. Something that was symbolic of our past, our present, and our future. After the Port Commission approved a $100,000 investment for the Legacy Project in 2018, key members of the Port of Tacoma and the City of Tacoma's Office of Arts and Cultural Vitality toured a number of potential sites where the art could be installed. Fireman's Park, with its commanding views of the port, the Tide Flats, and Commencement Bay, was ultimately chosen as the ideal site for the project. The park is in District 2 of the City of Tacoma, 
which is represented by Tacoma City Council member Robert Toms. Why this investment in Fireman's Park is so important is it just continues the wonderful relationship we've had for over a century with the Port of Tacoma. And anytime the city of Tacoma is trying to do something important, right there alongside us is the Port of Tacoma. And we have a relationship that creates commerce, it creates jobs, and it creates a sense of culture that we have here. So um, the city of Tacoma and the Port of Tacoma are one and the same. And we really appreciate their continued investment within our community. And, and I know not only for myself, but all of my colleagues on the city council greatly appreciate this, this significant investment in Fireman's Park. The city of Tacoma sent out a call for artists about the project and received a total of 30 applications from West Coast artists and teams. The advisory group unanimously chose Rotator Creative to do the project. Lance Kagey is a member of that Tacoma-based artist team. Rotator is a creative agency here in Tacoma. In fact, our studio it overlooks Fireman's Park, so we have a great vantage point for this actual uh, public art piece. Our team is made up of uh, Adam Otter and Kendon Shaw and myself who concepted and developed this piece and then uh, used a number of uh, great local uh, fabrication shops and, and other artisans to develop the piece. One of the members of the advisory committee for the project was Port of Tacoma Commissioner John McCarthy. While in college, John spent many years working as a longshoreman on Tacoma's working waterfront before he was first elected to the Port Commission in 1983. When I worked on the waterfront in the 1960s and 1970s, I worked on a lot of log ships uh, using a pike pole on the water with spikes on the bottom of my shoes. And log ships, uh, particularly uh, from Asia, were one of the big, big uh, job producing uh, shipping industries that we had here. Port Commissioner Kristen Ang was also a member of the project's advisory committee. Raised in Pierce County, Kristen was elected to the Port Commission in 2019. The Port Centennial Art Project is a great way to connect our residents to the Port of Tacoma and to our region's history. It's located in the historic heart of Tacoma at Fireman's Park with billion dollars view of port industry and priceless views of Commencement Bay and Mount Rainier. Now, art has the power to connect our heart, minds, and soul. And this art piece is all about the connections to the port and the port's rippling effect in the greater Tacoma region. The original plan was to hold a formal dedication ceremony at Fireman's Park once the installation of Swell was completed. But because of the pandemic, those plans had to be canceled. So instead, thanks to the power of Zoom videos and the talents of TV Tacoma, we're going to do a virtual ribbon cutting instead. So on the count of three, please use your scissors to help cut our ceremonial ribbon. One, two, three, cut! All right. And with that, both the new artwork in Fireman's Park is now officially open for everyone to enjoy. So gather up your family, your cameras, and your masks, and come on down to experience this great new artwork in Fireman's Park. We guarantee you'll have a really swell time. And if you take some great photos of the artwork and share them on social media, please include the hashtag SwellTacoma. Welcome back to City Line. With me is whew, somebody who occupies a big space in my heart. I'm talking about the executive director of the Rainbow Center, Mr. Troy Christensen. Welcome back, my dear. Thank you, Amanda. You always look so fabulous. I look like I'm living in the middle of COVID, and you look like you're um, New Year's Eve in New York. Ah. <laughs> Gosh, you know what? I'm going to tuck that inside and put that in the maybe next year I will be. Uh, so thank you for that. You just don't see me when I'm in my pajamas. So how's that? So Troy, um, the pandemic, speaking of people in pajamas, this pandemic, it's taken a toll on us. How are you and the Rainbow Center doing with all this? Well, it's been, we've had to change how we do pretty much every part of our business. 
Um, our gala this last year was virtual and Pride was a hybrid of live and virtual and it likely will be this coming year. Um, Tacoma Pride, which is, um, you know, we're used to having 15 to 20,000 people in a big street festival. And instead, if we're lucky by July 10th, we might be able to have some gatherings of 50 at some local establishments, but we definitely will not have the big street festival. Um, so we'll do a virtual parade again this year, like we did last year, and we'll have points of pride the entire month, but especially on July 10th throughout Pierce County. So when, when you talk about July 10th and then we do the math and think it's, it's, it's six months away, um, it just seems like how can that possibly be and how can you possibly have another pride that's virtual? So what have you learned and what do you have planned that you can kind of tease us with? Well, um, last year we were really in the, in the depths of this. I mean, we still are today as well, but the, the hope is as, as much as vaccines are coming into Washington state, that by July, there may be the opportunity to dine in again. There may be the opportunity to, um, you know, to maybe have a, um, you know, for the mix to have a party outside in the evening. Um, there may be the opportunity for families to get out and check out the different points of pride and see who's supporting the work that we do and see who's supporting our community um, as, you know, living who we authentically are. And so I don't know that we have any new tips for this year other than um, some things that we've learned about how things work electronically so that we don't have slowdowns and, and pauses. Um, we'll definitely be hardwired and not Wi-Fi. Um, things like that we've learned. Um, we also, I would say from last year, we learned that the community supports Tacoma Pride regardless of whether it's a big street festival or if it's in points of pride. And um, that was a, um, a really scary moment for us and a really um, joyous moment when we found out how much the businesses still wanted to support this. Oh, absolutely. And boy, when you said Wi-Fi versus hardwire, you are a virtual warrior to know the difference between those two <laughs> and what they can do to virtual programming. Yes. <laughs> um, speaking of some virtual programming, you have some classes for youth happening recently. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. Well, our education team has a new program called Band of Colors. This is funded by Tacoma Creates, and it is youth-centered theater-based programming for ages 18 and under for any youth under 18. You don't have to be LGBTQ. In fact, it's sort of designed to help everyone um, develop more who they are and have a better understanding of other people and how to support them. So we're offering three different classes that occur each month. Page to Stage is for eight and under, and it happens on the fourth Saturday of each month. And they use a different children's book each month to explore themes and character play. The second class we offer is for nine to 12 year olds called I'm Gonna Be Somebody. And it takes place on the fourth Tuesday of each month. And in this class, we focus on creating a safe space for young people to explore different characters to create play. And the third class is for 13 and up. And this is a performance writing class called scripting, self scripting. And it's offered the fourth Monday and Wednesday of each month. And in this class, we have participants write about themselves. It's our hope that all of these classes will help these youth foster an, an, um, a sense of self in a safe environment. And we are excited to be able to offer these um, virtually um, now and, the, and to do them for free because of the, the funding we get through Tacoma Creates. And even when we do um, move these to live, they will still be free to the community. So we're, we're very excited to have that resource available. You know, as you were talking about this, Troy, I was thinking about our youth and how difficult uh, this pandemic has been for many reasons for our youth. But one of the things that comes to mind is their ability to gather and to learn from each other and to sit down and talk and talk about their day and their differences has been taken away. Now, yes, we can do it virtually, but that's not the same, but these classes feel like they really get in 
and they start to work on those pieces that are missing as we learn to live together and also love together. So good on the Rainbow Center for doing this. Thank you. So also one of my favorite places to hang out is Alma Mater. I love their scrambled eggs. They have this wonderful outdoor eating area. Plus when things are up and running, they are an amazing venue. You have a, a partnership called Caring with Pride. Tell us what that is. Yes. Um, so when the pandemic first hit, our advocacy program, in addition to moving many things virtually, they got, they sat down and brainstormed and said, what does the community need right now? And a lot of people were losing their incomes, especially the lowest paid workers. And so they decided to put together um, a weekly giveaway. And so people come to the center um, one at a time and they get essentials like um, toiletries, gloves, socks, hats, shoes. Um, and then we were also um, getting food from Northwest Harvest. And so we were providing them boxes of uh, fresh produce and some non-perishable foods. When Alma Mater heard about this, they approached us and said, hey, we'd like to serve a hot meal, fresh hot meal to 100 people every week through your Caring with Pride. And we said, great, we love that idea. So they have been doing that for probably seven, eight months now. And it's a big expense to them when they like all restaurants, and I know they're bigger than a restaurant, but you know most of what they do um, that they earned money from, they're not doing right now. So knowing that they're supporting their community during their hardship really means a great deal to us. And then also partway through the year, Pierce County um, released some funding to help people um, who were facing eviction when the moratorium ends catch up on their rent. And so in the fourth quarter of this year, our advocacy team administered um, $300,000 worth of eviction rental assistance prevention to um, almost 100 households to keep them from, help them not be evicted when the moratorium ends. Um, and we were very trepidatious about administering that much money in rental assistance, given the size of our organization, because we're fairly small. And um, we did it in record time. And we're really happy that we got the experience to do that. Well, and you also, because it's in the wind and all over social media, you also received a Housing Hero Award from the city of Tacoma. So congratulations for your vision and for your generosity. That is huge. I mean, housing is everything um, for regardless of who you are. And whether we're in a pandemic or we're not, certainly in a pandemic and to not have a house is is just un, unthinkable. Um, so how fabulous that the little rainbow center that could steps in and saves the day. Yes, and it was really just three advocacy staff that did all that work. That is they have really worked their tails off. And you know, it's it's an it's a that really exhilarated exhaustion you feel when you accomplish something really big. And so while they're tired, they're happy that we've been able to do this. And it looks like there may be more coming in 2021. You and your team are, are, are outstanding, Mr. Troy. Um, since Biden took office, it appears that some of the damage that occurred to LBG, LBTTQ rights over the past four years have been reversed. That was one of his campaign promises. He, he has done that. Um, do you have any important updates for us that are kind of coming down the chute? Yes. Within the first 100 days of Biden being in office, um, there is a, an intent to move the Equality Act forward through the House, the Senate, and then to the president. It has been presented multiple times when there was not a majority Democrat um, in, in the House and the Senate, and it has not passed. Um, Biden is saying he is going to move this forward in his first 100 days. What this will mean is that in addition to um, the Supreme Court ruling last year that made it illegal to discriminate in employment based upon sexual orientation and gender identity, 
additional categories would be added through the Equality Act for housing, access to health care, credit, jury service, um, and many other things where currently it's legal to discriminate. And this will, I mean, it will make a huge difference to the lives of the LGBTQ communities in our Absolutely. country. And it will give us one more thing to virtually celebrate in terms of pride. Absolutely. <laughs> What's next for the Rainbow Center? What's coming up? Well, um, as I said, this the Band of Colors education program and pride. And this year, we are really going to be pushing hard on legislative advocacy at the federal level. Um, there are some things that are in the works at the state level as well. But at the federal level, um, we can band together with the centers across the country and make sure that we have the movement that we can make right now while we have the majority in the House and the Senate and a Democratic president. And so that's gonna be a big focus of our work this year. I love that. It is always just so wonderful to have you in my kitchen and to be in your office. <laughs> and uh, you continue to break new ground and to uh, hold the mantle uh, for LGBTQ IA2 here in Pierce County. So thank you, thank you so much for that. And I want to have you back on in the spring because the spring is three more months closer to Pride and we're going to need an update, okay? Wonderful. As always, thank you, Amanda. You're more than welcome, my dear. We have much more to come on City Line. We'll be right back after this quick break. City Line. With me, I have one of my favorite people. And no, not everybody is my favorite person. But this person crawled inside of my heart a long time ago. I'm talking about the Managing Artistic Director from Tacoma Little Theater, Mr. Chris Surface. How are you? I am doing well, Amanda. Thank you so much. And it's wonderful to see you today. Well, it's great to be seen by you. And oh my gosh, that is truly the lobby behind you, is it not? I am live in the lobby, remote broadcasting to you. I love this. It has been so long since I have seen the lobby behind you. Um, I think it probably was maybe back on the comfy couch, even before all of the COVID and remodel collided at the same time. <laughs> So Chris, speaking of remodel, um, I know you have some pictures that you're gonna um, narrate for us. So um, go ahead and get those ready to go here because um, every time I walk by Tacoma Little Theater or I drive by, I'm, just, I'm driving, I try not to cause a car accident. I slow down to kind of see how is the remodel going? So Chris, that's the million dollar question. How is it going? It's going extremely well. We've been so fortunate in the fact that we'd already planned to do this uh, back before the pandemic hit. So we always knew we were going to do this summer. And now having a little bit more time since we still can't open our doors yet to patrons again, it's given us a little more time to fine tune everything and do just a little bit more than we were initially planning to. Um, and so I've got some great pictures and I'll give you kind of the quick tour of what's been happening at Tacoma Little Theater back since uh, June when we started the remodel. So here's the first picture I've got for you today, Amanda. And this is actually um, the lobby, uh, which I'm live in right now, but this is a photo that I took just the other day. And you can see that we've redone the carpet, we've painted. Um, you'll notice that there's a door that used to be over uh, there, and I think I can move my mouse there. There used to be a door into the auditorium about right here, but that's now the ADA ramp. So our patrons with um, mobility challenges can use a ramp to get into the theater, which is gonna be great. Here's another shot of it kind of sitting, looking down, you can see the top of that ramp. You can see across the lobby there, the bathroom doors and the office door and the concessions counter. The bathrooms have not been remodeled yet. That's gonna be in our next phase of remodeling probably in the next five to 10 years, but they definitely got an upgrade with uh, some new paint, a new vanity in the women's restroom. So just some great things happening there. 
Um, and you can see that front door to kind of give you orientation. We went with gray and red as our color scheme for it and kind of went back to the original mid-century look of the building. We added some great lights over the middle of the floor so it's a little more warm and inviting to our patrons. There's just another shot from the concessions counter looking out. We are still a construction zone, so we're working through that. You can kind of see the new coffee counter where the coffee service will be and where the bar will be. Just another shot of it. We took some good shots to make sure. We can't wait to have people in the lobby actually uh, ordering or drinking anything. Here we go into the auditorium. Um, and the first thing that you'll see is the fact that the seats are um, kind of on a radius. You can kind of see there's an arc to those. And you'll also notice that they're not behind one another. They're actually staggered. And you'll also see the armrests, which are cup holders, which fold down. So you can either fold them up, snuggle next to your loved one, or fold them down and put the popcorn cup there. And so it's really nice that nobody's head is going to be in front of you. The rake of the auditorium is also steeper. And so you're actually sitting up higher than you've ever sat before in Tacoma Little Theater, which is just wonderful. There's another shot of them from the other direction. They're just waiting for people's butts to be in those seats and start getting used to seeing some shows there. And here's just another shot of the auditorium. We did have somebody stop by to sit ah. in the seat and test them out. And he said, they're very good seats. You could use a little more heat in here today, but it's very good seats. So um, we hope that uh, he will maybe stop by and uh, take a seat in the uh, auditorium real time and kind of experience what it's like. So that's kind of the quick tour of where we are with the auditorium and what it's gonna look like when you, our wonderful patrons, come back through. Well, Chris, I have to tell you, I was uh, laying in bed uh, after the inauguration and it was late. And I was surfing Facebook and suddenly Bernie Sanders showed up and I think he's in my seat. So you need to tell Bernie he needs to move or leave the mittens. <laughs> I, will, I will pass it on next time I see him here. <laughs> so, so Chris, what a beautiful tour. Thank you so much for doing that. So this is the big crystal ball question of when do you think Tacoma Little Theater will reopen? With the new Healthy Washington um, Safe Start plan, uh, phase two can allow performance venues to open at 25% in the future. There's some other stipulations there too. Um, the worry is that if we see cases tick, if we make it to phase two, but cases tick up, we go right back to phase one with essentially no notice. And so it's very hard to plan live in-person events when you always have that looming, uh, you might not be able to do it uh, in two weeks. So for us, we're kind of sticking with the virtual format with our education programs, our castmates program, our spaces, our page to screen program, um, and doing those virtually. And we're gonna kind of see what happens in the next few months. But realistically, from an industry standpoint, Dr. Fauci had said on a webinar for the arts a few weeks ago that fall, fall is the time to look where you can actually start coming back to some kind of normality in the performing arts. So we're hoping to be able to do some small shows in the fall to welcome people to the new auditorium. Cross your fingers and stay tuned. And they're crossed too. As we say. So you mentioned uh, that phrase, page to screen. Um, I want to talk about that program and how it came to be. We um, were looking for things to do that were a little bit different and ways that we could engage our community. So as a team, I have a wonderful staff and a wonderful group of people that I work with. We came up with the idea of, you know, there's so many great playwrights in our community alone who want to tell stories. Let's open it up to them. So we put out the call for scripts to be submitted to the Page to Screen program. And so it's focusing on local playwrights and letting them the have the opportunity to bring their scripts to a staged virtual reading format. And we just had uh, Buenas Noches Mama a few weeks ago written by Emily Cohen, which was about um, Argentina and the Dirty War and a very powerful story. It's actually some uh, family history from Emily woven into that story. We have coming up next month in February on the 20th, Skin by Anna Maria Gerzon, which is, talks about the tattoo trade both in the present and back historically. Um, and so we are so excited. We have a series of one acts coming up. We're going to try a musical page to screen performance later in the summer. And it's just so fun to see people coming together. While we can't be in person, we're at least coming together. And we've had some great support from our patrons who've come to watch those shows virtually with us. And they're still up on our website under the virtual programs. If you scroll down, you can see all the great programs that we've recorded for you for the page to screen program and our holiday programming too. You know, Chris, for gosh, the, the 26 some odd years I've lived in Tacoma, 
One of the first things that Tacoma Little Theater did that caught my eye was something called the South Sound Playwrights Festival. Actually, it was a Pierce County Playwrights Festival. And that was where I first got to see just a plethora of local talent. Susie Wilhoff, I mean, um, beautiful work she did there. So just to think that you're doing page to screen, which feels almost like that, really warms my heart because it helps us kind of get an idea of all the talent that surrounds us. It's, it has been so rewarding. Um, and it's exposing us to new works and new ideas and just the kind of thing that we need in our society today. Um, before I let you go, I want to talk about the CARES Shuttered Venues Act and what it is and how it's affecting uh, our industry. So this is, a, this is a loaded question, and I'll kind of give the cliff notes. Um, so nonprofits in the new CARES Act, we have the opportunity to apply for the Payroll Protection Program or the Shuttered Venues um, Operating Grant, which is a great program. However, when they designed it, they left language in from when it was just aimed towards concert venues. And so we're currently working with legislatures. You might hear a call out from help, for help from us because when you're a community theater, your artists, your actors usually don't receive compensation. They do it for the fun, for the love of it, they volunteer. Or if they receive something, it's a small stipend that's not considered a, a fair wage. And so the situation is that Shuttered Venue program only allows for paid artists. And so 20,000 community theaters from across the country are potentially shut out from accessing those funds in the CARES package. So a lot of uh, movers and shakers are working on this and uh, we hope that uh, we will see that. If not, we'll definitely have the PPP that we can fall back on. But it's still tough knowing that we probably aren't going to be back until fall to make sure that we keep the lights on and uh, keep people entertained with what we're able to do. So based upon what you just said, how can your patrons help you right now? Contact our senators, our representatives, and let them know that community theaters should not be left out of the shuttered venues grant. Um, we'll have some more information that we'll definitely have on our website and Facebook page. Um, but it's definitely something to say, don't forget about them. We're just as, just as important. And most of your uh, professional artists, your actors, come, came up through community theater. If not all of them, okay? That's true. So, you know, Chris, it's always wonderful to talk with you. And thank you so much for the beautiful tour. And um, I'm sure I'll be talking with you in the spring as we uh, continue to shake that crystal ball and to say, is it time yet for this to open? So um, thank you to you and yours and your fabulous team and to the bacon and egg socks that you have on right now. That you cannot show us because you would probably fall out of your chair. Um, you are my constant reminder that sock cam will come back. So Chris, thank you so much. Thank you, Amanda. It's a joy to have been here with you today. Well, that wraps up another great segment of City Line. It is always a pleasure and a privilege to be in your home, zooming from my kitchen. We've given you some really great things to participate in virtually here in our wonderful city. We're still fighting this pandemic, so please wear your mask, wash your hands, keep your gatherings small, and of course, keep yourself socially distanced but not emotionally distant. Reach out to your neighbors and your loved ones. And when you do that, we'll be waiting for you right here at City Line. Take care. Please.
This is the City of Tacoma's 24-hour information channel, TV Tacoma. Watch us, watch Tacoma.